Thank you very much for joining us for this press conference discussing the first results from the muon G-2 experiment. My name is Kevin Pitts. I am the Chief Research Officer at Fermilab and will be serving as moderator. Fermilab is one of 17 national laboratories managed by the U.S. Department of Energy, and we're the host lab for the muon G-2 experiment, which has more than 200 collaborators from seven countries. Hopefully, you have a copy of the press release and materials. If not, you can find them on the Fermilab website, and we recently posted a link to, directly to them in the chat window. We are talking to you today because of a new experimental measurement, but that measurement would not be interesting if it weren't for the equally precise theoretical calculation. An immense amount of time, effort, and brain power have gone into these two parallel efforts that are both necessary to explore this science. And it's really the comparison between these two results, each a true tour de force in its own right, that makes for interesting and exciting science. Joining us for this press conference are Aida El Khadra, Professor of Physics at the University of Illinois, a theoretical physicist specializing in lattice gauge calculations. Professor El Khadra serves as the co-leader of the Muon G-2 Theory Initiative, a global effort to bring scientists from around the world together to produce this incredibly precise theoretical calculation. Dr. Graziano Benanzoni, a physicist at the Italian National Institute for Nuclear Physics in Pisa, and co-spokesperson of the Muon G-2 experiment, and Chris Polly, senior scientist at Fermilab and co-spokesperson of the Muon G-2 experiment. Chris was also a graduate student on the Muon G-2 experiment at Brookhaven National Lab 20 years ago. Chris will give us a very brief overview of the result, and then we can move on to your questions, when you could, which you can submit in the Q&A window on Zoom. Please let us know your name and media outlet. With that, I'll hand it over to Chris. Thanks, Kevin. Give me just a second here. Okay, well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it's nice to be here talking to you today uh, on the heels of freshly announcing the first result from this experiment at Fermilab. Um, we know not everybody could attend the, the scientific colloquium that was just given. And for some of you who did, uh, we thought it would still be useful to go through and have a brief recap. Uh, so I'll flip through some slides and then we'll leave plenty of time to answer any questions you guys you guys might have. Um, so this just shows an overview of the Fermilab complex, kind of a rendering of it, um, and an idea that emerged about 10 years ago. You can see from the data on this slide, this was way back in 2012. The whole effort actually started a few years prior to that. And the idea was to take this Fermilab accelerator complex that had previously been used uh, the parts of it that had been used to make antimatter beams for the Tevatron program, take that part of the complex and convert it into a source capable of making intense beams of muons, a uh, subatomic particle that we call the muon. And so you, here you can see a rendering of the idea taken way back in 2012. And here you can see how that reality evolved over the last 10 years. Um, you see the set of three buildings kind of arrayed in a triangle there. That's the last stage of the Fermilab accelerator complex where we do the final manipulations of the particle beam before we bring it into the experiments. And then the two buildings you see in the background uh, house two experiments. Uh, the one on the right is where the experiment we're talking to about today is housed. That's the muon G-2 experiment and our sister experiment called mu to e um, So one thing I'd like to emphasize is that this is a first result that we're talking about today, but it really represents a string of results that will be coming for the next 10 years from this facility we call the Muon Campus at Fermilab. Um, so we're excited to be here today talking about the first results from what truly will be a sort of 10 year program at, at Fermilab. Um, so taking a step back, uh, since we use the subatomic particle called the muon, I thought it'd be good to first explain to everybody a little bit about what a muon actually is. So you can see this tableau, this tableau on the left, those are all the fundamental particles we know about in nature. They're the most basic, basic ingredients. They're more, more fundal, fundamental even than the periodic table of elements. And the muon is one of those constituents. It's a, a basic ingredient in the recipe of the universe. It's very much like an electron. That's why you can see it. It's cast in this table down in the lower left where it's right next to the electron, the normal electrons you would find circulating around an atom. It's similar in the sense that it has the same electrical charge and it has the same spin properties. You can kind of think of uh, electrons and muons as little spinning tops. It has some important differences. Uh, first of all, they're 200 times more massive, 
which allows us to use them as probes to search for new physics uh, in some, some ways more readily than the electron. And they're unstable. They only live for two millionths of a second. So once you make one, you don't get very long to, to, to work with it and run your experiments with it. That's also why we depend on a particle accelerator at Fermilab. Uh, you just can't go out and scoop up a clump of dirt and find muons in it uh, because they will have already decayed. Um, they are raining down on us naturally all the time from cosmic ray interactions, but we make very intense sources of them at the, at the laboratory. So these muons, uh, you know, much like electrons, they have they generate their own little magnetic field uh, because they're they have charge and they have spin. Uh, they have you can basically think of them as little bar magnets, uh, you know, spinning about making their their magnetic field. Um, we're very interested in this experiment in determining exactly how strong that internal magnetic field is that's generated by the muons. Um, it turns out you can determine exactly how strong they are by taking muons and putting them inside a magnetic field where they undergo a motion very analogous to the gyroscope you see in the picture on the lower right. So if you've ever played with these, you know a gyroscope has an axis that it spins about. And if you set it on a tabletop and give it a little push, that whole spinning axis will rotate uh, you know, about the gravitational field you can't see that keeps it in the upright position. That's very similar to what happens to uh, spin, you know, particles with spin like the muon when you put them in a magnetic field. They'll rotate just like that, and we call that precession. This, and, and the frequency that they rotate about uh, is really determined by two things, the strength of that little internal magnet that we're trying to determine and the strength of that external field that you put them in. So basically by watching the rate that they revolve around and around, that's how we determine how strong that internal magnet is. Um, we're particularly interested in that, and we, we define a quantity called the G factor, which is just a coefficient out front uh, that tells you how strong uh, the magnetic field generated by that muon really is. Uh, it's interesting, it's had a long history. You know, at the turn of the last century, classical physicists would have thought that the G factor should be one, you should be able to determine the strength of that magnet, and that scaling factor G should just turn out to be one. However, with the advent of relativistic quantum mechanics, um, sort of in the 1930s, it became clear that the expectation theoretically was two. Um, but as you might guess from the name of, ex of the experiment, there's a little more to the story. That's why we're called muon G minus two, because we look at the part that differs in that G factor uh, from being the perfect two. So, and the reason that's interesting and the reason G isn't identically two is because the muon, like other particles, is never really alone in the universe. It's constantly surrounded by an entourage of other particles that fluctuate in and out of existence. They, they don't exist before. It's not like they're lurking under the covers. They really pop into existence and then they disappear just as quickly as they came. Uh, oftentimes you'll see that referred to as quantum foam. And so this shows a, a picture of sort of what that, what that looks like with a muon spinning, processing, particles appearing all the time uh, in an external magnetic field overlaid. Um, so the reason this is interesting is because uh, you can calculate very precisely what that rotation rate should be based on all the particles we know about. So if you go out and run an experiment and you determine that rotation rate and you compare it to what we expect, the question is, do you get the same answer? Because not only do the particles we know about contribute to this, but it also has the potential for the ones we don't know about to contribute. Uh, those, particles, uh, th those particles can come from any one number of very big questions that we're trying to understand about the universe. Uh, for instance, we look out in the universe right now and we see roughly four or five times the matter that we would expect based on what's visible to us. We don't really understand. We think we might be swimming in a sea of background particles all the time that just haven't been directly discovered. Those are the kind of things that can appear and affect that rotation rate. Or, you know, there's other more sophisticated theories like supersymmetry that try to explain facts like why was the Higgs mass when it was discovered so light? Um, and of course, as an experimentalist, what I'm interested in is anything that might change that number because there might be monsters we haven't yet imagined that are emerging from the vacuum, interacting with our muons, and this gives us a window into seeing them. And so it gets, the story gets particularly interesting because about 20 years ago, this experiment was performed at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And actually at Brookhaven, they found a hint that there might be new particles, new forces contributing uh, to this rotation rate of muons in the magnetic field. Uh, you can see on this plot, what I'm plotting here is what a quantity we call the anomalous magnetic moment. 
it's the part of that G factor that differs from two, the interesting part that only depends on all the particles that are fluctuating in and out of existence. And you can see by the purple band, this was the experimental determination from Brookhaven 20 years ago compared to the standard model theory uh, as it's been calculated uh, through today. And you can see there's a significantly large white space in between them. In fact, you know, this difference uh, has grown over the years to become what we call in particle physics, a, a sort of three sigma level result, meaning you would only expect this much white space about three out of a thousand times you ran the experiment. So it starts to get unlikely. And in fact, that significance has even grown with improvements of the theory uh, to a 3.7 sigma discrepant result. So this difference has been intriguing for physicists for many years to understand, you know, have we started to see a hint of new physics emerging um, in this measurement? And so that brings me to the experiment we, we've constructed at Fermilab. The idea at Fermilab was to take the device that was used at Brookhaven, um, bring it to Fermilab, where it could be coupled to uh, some of the world's most powerful accelerator beams. To make this experiment better, to understand that quantity better, we really need 20 times the number of muons that Brookhaven used in the experiment. And in this picture, you can see what the device looked like at Brookhaven uh, 20 years ago. So the goal for us was to bring that device and couple it to the Fermilab complex. That was quite a challenge. Um, parts, of that, parts of that device didn't come apart and were 50 feet in diameter. And so we transported it 3,200 miles uh, by sea and by land, and which made some fantastic photos. You can see on the upper right here, a picture of the parts of the ring that didn't come apart mounted on a big red lifting fixture coming out of the building at Brookhaven. You can see it put on a transporter, a specialized transporter on the lower left. Um, and you can see it being barged onto a crane in the lower, or, or, sorry, onto a, put, craned onto a barge in the lower right. Uh, the most difficult part of the transport was in the Chicago area because we had to travel through 30 miles of Chicago suburbs. That was the closest approach to Fermilab from the river system. And you can see to do that, we ended up having to go through some extraordinary efforts with the coordination of many, many local officials. Um, and you can see some beautiful pictures here at least for us, not necessarily for the people stuck in traffic uh, of when we shut down interstates in the Chicago area on two separate occasions, two separate evenings for a few hours while we transported the ring to the, to the laboratory. Uh, as I said, it made for some amazing photo opportunities. You can see on the upper left how the storage ring magnet looked as it was traveling in front of the St. Louis Arch. You can see how it looked uh, on the transporter coming off of the barge uh, at the Fermilab end. On the upper right, you can see uh, all the people that came out to welcome the magnet as, as appeared, the community was really excited. Uh, the news had been out. And so we had many, many people come out to help us welcome the wings, the rings arrival. In the lower right, uh, you can see a picture just taken after the clouds, after the crowds left and the clouds emerged. Uh, this, this beautiful, beautiful scene emerged uh, after everybody had gone home. So coming back to present day, uh, we have the device here at Fermilab. It was all put back together. Um, it took many years of work to get it put back together, uh, operate it, and collect the data, analyze the data that we're presenting today. Um, so to recap how the experiment works, you can think of muons as being little spinning tops, um, and you put them in a, if you put them in a magnetic field, they process, they rotate, much like this analogous gyroscope you see here. We inject those muons through a beam line from Fermilab that comes in in the back of the building where they get, enter our storage ring which you can basically think of as a racetrack for the muons. The muons go traveling around this racetrack at 99.94% of the speed of the light, revolving the whole time they're doing it. And our goal in the experiment is to measure that revolution frequency uh, extremely precisely. Uh, we're an extremely large collaboration. You know, there's well over 200 scientists, engineers, technicians that have worked on this project over the years. Uh, we come from now, you know, roughly a total of 40 institutions spread across seven countries. Um, and one of the interesting things about the experiment without going into all the details of the analysis is that we do a blind analysis. Uh, that's very common in particle physics because you know everybody's really excited to understand what the final result will emerge from these sort of basic tests of, of how the universe works. And so that we don't actually know the answer the whole time we're taking the data, the whole time that we're analyzing that data, we uh, don't allow, our, uh, allow ourselves to know the answer. And the way we do that is a very, uh, a very, a very clever trick. Uh, we have a clock that beats and we need to determine what that rotation frequency of the muons is using that clock. So the way we keep people from knowing that frequency exactly 
is we just don't tell them what frequency the clock is beating at. We keep it behind a locked cabinet so that nobody on the experiment actually knows. And two people on the, not even on the experiment come in and check it. So it's a little like having a watch on your wrist that runs too fast. You can never really know what time of day it is um, until you, you know, get the watch fixed and reveal and reveal how fast it was really ticking. Uh, so that's what we do. Um, we unblinded this physics result back on February 25th. Uh, we had 170 of those over the 200 collaborators that I mentioned that phoned in uh, during COVID times to be present for the moment that the result was revealed. Um, and after two years of detailed analysis, everybody was extremely happy to reveal those results for the first time. So let me just step through the plot. You've probably seen it in the press release. I just want to step by through it one, at a, one point at a time and really explain what's inside of it. So first of all, this point shows the Brookhaven result plotted in terms of that anomalous magnetic moment I discussed earlier, the value that determines how much G is different from two and how much these virtual particles contribute uh, to, the, to the muon's internal magnet. Uh, and you can see the point there represents the value that was determined at the Brookhaven experiment. And the width of those lines tells you the uncertainty on that experiment. And the big question that we've been asking for 20 years was, you know, was the Brookhaven experiment correct? Uh, you know, or is there something wrong with the experiment? We needed a better, more precise experiment to really tell us. Um, and that's where the Fermilab experiment comes in. So although we use the same container, it's a much upgraded experiment. Uh, everything about the experiment has been vastly improved. Um, and here you can see the first results emerging from our experiment at Fermilab. The main things to note in this are that um, the Fermilab experiment is now, even though this is just a result from our very first year of data taking, uh, this result is already 15% more, more precise than Brookhaven. Both experiments were dominated by their statistical error. They're in great agreement. Um, it was quite a moment to see uh, that the Fermilab experiment really uh, agreed with the Brookhaven after all this time. Um, so because they're in good agreement, it's safe to combine them. And this, as you can see, this you can now see is the experimental world average uh, for both the Brookhaven and Fermilab results uh, in combination. Of course, the error bar gets a little smaller uh, because you have two experiments that are in good agreement. The interesting part is, of course, to compare back to the standard model prediction and ask how much that white space might have changed. And you can see that's the theoretical prediction uh, plotted in the green on the left there. Uh, the significance has now grown to over four standard, four standard deviations. And just, just to put that in context, um, you would only expect that to happen by chance about one in 40,000 times that you ran the experiment. Uh, so we can say fairly conclusively here that there must be something contributing to this white space that we don't understand. So just to conclude, this result strengthens the evidence that there could be new particles and forces in nature that are contributing to the muon's internal magnet. Um, after 20 years, we finally confirmed the Brookhaven experimental results. Um, combining those results leads to this 4.2 sigma tension, uh, which really only has a one in 40,000 chance uh, that it could be due to chance. Uh, so the big question remains, uh, is this difference between theory and experiment due to new monsters lurking out there, uh, popping in and out of the vacuum, contributing to the muon's internal magnet? Um, there are four uh, technical articles that have appeared today. They're all appearing on the archive and they're being published as open access on the physical review website. Uh, so we'd reference you the, to those articles if you want more details. And I just wanna point out that we're really just getting started on this experiment. There's much more data to come. Run one results, the, runs, the results from run one really represent only 6% of the full statistics we plan to take. This plot shows the data collection versus time. The red part is what we are talking about today. We're in the, mid, in the middle of an analysis of data that was taken from runs two and three. We expect to produce a result from that, uh, from that data, uh, from those data sometime next summer. And that will be an additional factor of two reduction in the uh, experimental uncertainty overall. Eventually, we plan to collect another uh, large set of data that will reduce that experimental error by another factor of two. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, we have several people here to answer your questions. I'll put the plot up on the screen and remind you that if you have more questions after this press conference, there's a link below uh, to media at fnal.gov that you can get in touch with. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chris, for that nice summary. Uh, we're ready now to, uh, to go to questions. Uh, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A window. 
uh, and please include your name and affiliation and uh, I will help direct traffic and get the questions to our experts. Uh, let me start with a question for uh, Professor Aida El Qadra. Aida, um, Chris just showed us that you have we have uh, really two experimental measurements that are in really pretty significant disagreement with the theoretical calculation. How should we interpret that? Uh, you know, for example, is there a chance that just one of these two, either the experiment or the theory, is just wrong? Well, I wouldn't dare comment on. <laughs> on the chance that the experiment is wrong. And certainly what Chris has told us is uh, making that extremely uh, unlikely. Um, but statistical fluctuations are now also, as Chris has already explained, extremely unlikely to, to uh, provide us a resolution of this tension. As far as the standard model calculations are concerned, they are very solid. Uh, the uh, main, the main uncertainty in the standard model calculation actually comes from a data-driven approach. So the errors are also dominated by experimental measurement errors, in particular also statistical errors. So there is actually a rather clean statistical interpretation of this discrepancy. That is the, the standard statistical interpretation that Chris has already mentioned. Um, you know, there, there can, of course, be some surprises in the, you know, still, still lurking, uh, but increasingly it is getting harder to, to make, to say that, I would say. I think that it is really telling us, this result is really starting to tell us something that is, um, that we cannot account for within the standard model. Thanks, Aida. Graziano, um, Aida just talked a little bit about the fact that the, ex these, the experimental measurements are limited by statistics, which is another way of saying you need more muons. And in fact, Chris showed us that you have more data. Can you just say a little bit about how you expect this result to evolve uh, and, and including, including more data? What, what will happen to that error bar, you know, say a year from now? Yes. Thanks. That's a good question. Thanks, Kevin. So let me say the following. As Chris was just uh, showing, uh, these results are based, the results that we have just announced, are based on the statistics of uh, positrons that we collected, which is slightly better than the ones of the previous experiment, so the Brookhaven one. Now, we already have in our hands something like 10 times of these statistics. So this means that we can significantly improve it, our measurement. And in fact, our aim, our goal is that at the end of all, after analyzing all the data, this can be, I know, some years from now, we would like to reduce by factor four the, the precision. So really, this will be an impressive measurement. Something like one, 140 part per a billion, which is really a, a amazing precision, which are the, the short term plans. So in the same time when we were releasing, so we were just releasing the, these results, a, a part of the collaboration is analyzing the new data that we are collecting. So in particular, we, have, we are analyzing now a statistics of the following run. So what is called run two and run three. So what we presented is based on run one. So we, 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 we collect also run two, run three, and we are now collecting run four. And, and the part of our collaboration are analyzing run two, uh, run two and run three data. So the, the, the amount of data that we are analyzing is something like four times the statistics that we have just uh, announced. So this means that most likely in a couple of years from now, we will be able to present a new measurement with a precision, a factor two better. So this means that uh, uh, we are now speculating, of course, because we don't know. As Chris was showing you, we have this uh, blinded uh, experiment. So we really don't know anything until the very last. But it may be, we are just speculating that if the new measurement, for example, that we are going to present, let's say in two years from now, will be consistent, will be confirmed 
what we just uh, presented. This means that, uh, well, this could this start to be uh, something very close. It could be, of course, something very close to the famous five standard deviation threshold, which formalize a discovery for uh, our community. So I think it's a very exciting mo moment, not only for what we've just presented, but also for the close future. Thank you, Graziano. Aida, the next question is for you. This is from Seth Borenstein from the Associated Press. Given the results from the muon G-2 experiment and last month's CERN LHCB announcement, how likely do you think it is that there is a new standard part, new particle or force out there that's causing these results? Could it be the same particle or force and could dark matter play a role here? Could you put some kind of rough percentage likelihood that we're looking at new physics? Thank you. Kevin, did you say this was for me? Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, that is a really good uh, question. Um, so just uh, going back to what we've already said, in terms of likelihood of new physics, we can quantify that for each of these results uh, separately. And the uh, um, results that were recently announced uh, from the LHCB experiment at CERN aren't quite at the same significance level. And what is really exciting about those results is that with more statistics, with more experimental data, the significance of the tension um, for these lepton universality violating ratios has increased rather than decreased. And that has all of us really uh, perking up our ears and considering the effects of new physics. Um, so the muon G minus two tension is larger and we've already heard the numbers for, uh, for the likelihood that, that that going away, which is exceedingly small, um, but we really need to wait until we reach five sigma. So if we are in the place in a few years where both the standard model prediction and the experimental results stay where they are with errors reduced, we will certainly be able to claim discovery of new physics from muon G minus two alone. Uh, it is also true that uh, the beyond the standard model theories would, um, most of them would probably have different effects in these different quantities. Uh, and so uh, in particular, it may not be the same particles in a beyond the standard model theory or the same uh, ways in which these new particles are contributing to these different uh, observations. And that is indeed the power of having several of these tensions because that really will allow us to look at all of the different possibilities for new physics models, models of dark matter, models that include supersymmetry and supersymmetric particles, they have to fit into all of these observations at once. And that exploration, of course, has been going on for uh, quite a few years uh, and will be intensified uh, now with this, with this result. For me, it is really too soon to say there is this beyond the standard model theory that fits everything and is the most likely candidate to explain new physics. I'm not quite ready to say that yet. Uh, but I think dark matter theories, uh, uh, sorry, uh, beyond the standard model theories that include, that explain dark matter are certainly candidates in both, in both scenarios. They'll be not, um, you know, not, not, not all uh, with the same weights and with the same um, yeah, consistency, I might say. Thank you, Aida. Chris, uh, this next question is for you, and it, it's related somewhat to what Graziano was talking a bit about earlier. This is from Frank Brodolution from German National Radio. When do you hope to reach five sigma, and are there other experiments planned to confirm this result? Good, good question, good question. So um, as Graziano mentioned, we're expecting to cut the experimental error bar in half um, in of order a year from now. It could be sort of on the time scale of not this summer, but the following summer that, the, that we'll, re we'll release our next result. Um, so we're, anxiously, uh, we're anxious to see what happens to the theoretical value over that same time, because as Aida said, there'll be uh, some renewed interest in understanding all the details 
Um, that result has the potential to cross into five sigma. Um, if you know, if the experimental values stayed the same, the theoretical values stayed the same, uh, we could be looking at five sigma discovery threshold, um, you know, by a year from this summer. And then when we have the additional factor two reduction error, uh, then it, that will take yet a couple of more years because we're still taking that data sample and it's yet to be analyzed. So that's kind of the time scale. And remind me, Kevin, what was the other part of the question? Are there other experiments planned to verify or this result? Thank you. So, so we have some colleagues in Japan that are working on an experiment also to measure G minus two. It's a very different design for the experiment that uses a much smaller device where you're uh, better to able to control the uniformity of the magnetic fields involved. Um, and they use a, a much different muon source for the experiment, really a, a pioneering, uh, very scientifically interesting muon source that they're using. And so that experiment still is several years out. Uh, I think in their first phase, they would like to um, achieve the level of precision of Brookhaven and then see how much further that technique can go beyond that. But that's the, that's the only other muon G minus two experiment out there. There are of course other efforts to measure electron G minus two as well, which doesn't tend to be as sensitive to some of the same physics. It's sensitive to things, but, but it's a, a nice complementary measurement. Thank you, Chris. Aida, we have another question for you. This is from Adrian Cho from Science Magazine. Assuming the G minus two excess is real, would it necessarily predict a signal for the mu to E experiment? Or could you get a signal in G minus two and not in mu to E? And what would that tell you if that happened? Would that be more or less interesting than seeing signals in both experiments? Well, seeing signals in both experiments would be uh, extremely exciting. There's, there is no, there is no question about that. Um, a, um, a real discovery of new physics in muon G minus two does not by itself imply a, um, that we will see something in mu to E. The mu to E experiment actually uh, probes uh, something different. It probes the conversion of a muon into an electron. So the two can be related, but they are not, uh, they're not related in all explanations of beyond the standard model physics. So indeed, the mu to E experiment will probe new physics, will probe you know, complementary aspects of new physics from muon G minus two, and is equally important to pursue and will give us additional information for us to understand the properties of the new physics. Thanks, Aida. And, and, and a follow-up maybe for Graziano, uh, uh, just for folks in the audience, the mu-to-e experiment is another muon experiment that is planned to run at Fermilab uh, later in this decade. Um, so, so both of the experiment, both the mu-to-e experiment uh, that was part of Adria's question, and also of course the G minus two experiment that we're talking about today are making measurements with muons. And we heard earlier that these muons only live for a couple of millionths of seconds. So could you just say a few words about how in the world we can produce these things and make measurements with them when they're gone in a blink of an, a less than a blink of an eye? That's really a really good question. So let me say, first of all, the muons, we are, we are uh, heated by the muons because the muons are naturally produced in the cosmic uh, rays. So when the, the radiation arrives to the earth and also today, just now we are heated by the muons. So, but these are what they are produced naturally. So how we produce the muons in our laboratory. So first of all, let me say that it's, it's absolutely true that the muons lives two microseconds, but this is, is only in the reference system. So what we call muons at rest. But if you, uh, let's say, accelerate or increase the velocity of the muons at the level of the speed of light, then thanks to the a, a, a feature of the relativity, so what Einstein was uh, suggesting more than 100 years ago, the time goes slower, it goes slower, slower, and slower. And it happens, for example, that in our experiment, the two microseconds in the, in the system where the muons are rest in our laboratory became 64 microseconds. So increase of a factor of 30. So 64 microseconds can be seen in the very small, uh, very small number for uh, normal life, let's say. We are, we are 
sensitive to one second, minutes, hour, etc. But in our field, so in particle physics, 64 microseconds is a huge number. It's really a huge number. And we can measure very precisely all the properties of this met these muons in 64 microseconds. So essentially, how they are produced? Well, it happens again, maybe by miracle, I don't know, that these muons are produced simply by the decay of a, a little bit higher particle, which is a pions. So the pions is completely different from the muons. And it has similar mass, but not the same. By the way, it is very interesting because during the Second World War, it was thought that the pions and the muons were the same particle. It was called at the time the mesotron, but this was not, uh, not, not true. And uh, there is also an interesting story, which tell you that, uh, in fact, uh, it was discovered that the pions, which is uh, the, carry or the carrier of the nuclear force, you know, what really needs for the protons and, and for the neutron to stay together, is different from the muons, which is what we call a lepton, and this, uh, this difference was experimentally proved in Italy. It was during the Second World War, where uh, a, a group of three people uh, uh, found by measurement that the pion is not the muon. But this is a different story. So let me say, let me come to your question. So the muons are produced by the decay of the pion. So what do we have to do? We have to do, we have to produce protons, for example, and smash protons against uh, some uh, target. In this, uh, in this uh, uh, interaction, we have the decay product and the decay product that are pions. And just allow the pions to decay and then we have muons. And then we, can, we have to store the muons for about uh, a little bit more than 64 microseconds, like 100 or 200 or 300. And what we do is 700 microseconds, I was told. Okay. Thank you, Graziano. Aida, I have two questions for you now. Uh, the first one is from Martin Schufens in Germany. If this measurement is an indication for a new particle, can you say what range of mass that new particle might fall within? And is that range of mass um, something that an accelerator could explore? Uh, that's a really good question. And uh, I, wish, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, what, what the uh, discrepancy, if it becomes a discovery, uh, will tell us uh, is uh, how much new particles can contribute to the anomalous magnetic moment. They have to account for that difference. And so these new particles are, will be in other diagrams where you have to integrate over the available momenta, et cetera. So in the end, what we can, based on your beyond the standard model theory, we can use this difference to constrain the possible masses, but also the possible strengths of the couplings of these new particles to the standard model particles. So it's that combination that we will get information about. Um, if the uh, couplings are pretty large, then the masses would be, roughly speaking, small enough that you would see them um, that, uh, sorry, that depending on the ranges of the, of the you know, possible couplings in these models that are not already excluded by other observations, etc., it is entirely possible that these particles can be detected at the Large Hadron Collider, for example. Um, so the larger the masses, the particle's mass might be, the smaller at, in principle is its contribution here, and it might be significant if it couples with a larger coupling, vice versa, you might have really, really light particles that, uh, that are elusive, that have very small couplings that are contributing here that um, you know, might be seen at the Large Hadron Collider by looking at highly displaced vertices and things like that. So looking in places where that has been hard to, to actually, that the experiments have had a hard time looking at now and with the upgrades, we'll actually be able to see those, those uh, signatures for those particles as well. So um, we need more information 
while we will have a discovery, we need more information both on the experimental side and detailed studies of the beyond the standard model theories that can contribute in order to actually get information about who these particles are. Thanks, and that, you know, that's a great point. Uh, when I think about um, kind of our global high energy physics um, program, uh, we're trying to look at all of these questions from many different angles. We heard uh, earlier about it, yet another experiment that we'll be running at Fermilab. Aida mentioned the Large Hadron Collider that operates at CERN in, in Geneva. Uh, and uh, we're working on uh, new neutrino experiments. And, and the whole idea is to try to get this kind of comprehensive picture so that we can see how all of these pieces of the puzzle fit together. Thank you for that. Another question for you, Aida, is from Michael Greshko at National Geographic. Is there a plan in place for future updates to the neutrino, uh, to the, sorry, excuse me, for future updates to the theoretical prediction to incorporate future results from lattice QCD supercomputer simulations? Some early results from simulations like these reduce the tension between theory and observations. In addition, you've also said that a five sigma result would be a sign of new physics and that the lattice QCD results would clarify what these, where these new physics are, are occurring. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, thank you. That's a, a very astute question. Uh, so um, there is a there is a number of different uh, lattice calculations that have uh, that are addressing the dominant contributions that are that are the sorry the contributions that give us the dominant error in the standard model prediction. We have also a data driven approach. Um, that, uh, that is forming the basis of the standard model prediction. So uh, the lattice calculations provide us with a, uh, with a uh, approach to, to the standard model prediction that is entirely based on standard model theory. Data-driven approaches um, mean that, we have, that we're taking experimental data where we uh, assume that those experimental data by themselves don't contain new physics. Based on everything we know about these data, that is a very, very reasonable assumption. And about lattice calculations would help clarify that it is really entirely, that those predictions are really not, not have no contributions from new physics. Now, the, uh, the uh, question I think referred to a new lattice calculation that came out last year um, which has a small enough error to actually um, see whether there is uh, to, to um, look at the difference between it and data-driven approaches. And it uh, shows a slight tension, which is not significant enough to really worry about. And in fact, the calculation itself needs to be scrutinized further. It's very interesting um, result, but there's, um, half a dozen other groups around the world that are working on these calculations. And we are expecting uh, some of the groups to provide updates with improved precision. The work of the theory initiative will also continue and uh, we will continue to collect all of the information we have and provide updates on the standard model theory, both from data-driven and from lattice calculations. I think in the end, we have to see how everything fits together. And if there are you know, differences between them, then we have to resolve those differences. Um, but that doesn't, any of these differences just tell us something about how new physics is entering into this. It does not really affect the overall, uh, the overall conclusion that if we have a difference at five sigma, that we have a discovery of new physics. Thanks, Aida. Uh, a uh, follow-up question regarding your calculations from Adrian Cho from Science Magazine. Uh, the Muon G-2 experimenters went to great lengths to do a blind analysis. Are the theoretical calculations also blinded in some way? Uh, are the lattice calculations done blind? And what about the data-driven approaches? So it is really difficult to do that. Um, 
for the data-driven approaches in particular, the cross-section measurements are inputs into the evaluations. To provide a blind analysis is very, very difficult there um, and has not been attempted. Uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, the theory initiative's goal is to provide predictions of the standard model theory before each new um, experimental announcement from the experiment. So in that sense, we hope to be blind to the next significant update where the experimental errors are significantly reduced. So we're not looking at that and try to move in one or the other direction. Lattice calculations in principle can be blind as well, but it is problematic to do when it takes years, which it's taking to do that. Um, our collaboration has done uh, some analyses uh, blind, and uh, that is something that we may consider in the future for this calculation as well. Um, there are ways to do that, and we have done that in the past for some other interesting quark flavor calculations. That is not completely accepted practice yet, but it may change also with the BMW result. That might be a, a, good, a good thing to do. Right now, we're still figuring out the details. We want to compare pieces of the calculation against each other. Uh, in order to see how well we understand all of the approximations, and that is really better done not not blind. So we're not quite there yet. Thanks, Aida. Uh, I, another question for you. Uh, this is uh, from Seth Borenstein at the Associated Press. Um, how theory shaking would you put these results when looking in context of the 50 years of the standard model? How, how, how earth shaking are these results compared to some of the other things that have happened? Uh, is it the biggest potential crack in so many years? I, well, yes. Let me make it a very short answer this time. Um, let me let me uh, uh, pose a, a question to you, Chris. You were a graduate student on the Brookhaven experiment that found this uh, intriguing result approximately 20 years ago. So my question is in two parts, actually. One part is, what took us so long to to follow up? And the second part is, how does it feel for you to have been have devoted so much of your career to this mystery to kind of see it unfold? Okay, great, great questions. Uh, so let's start. So the first one, uh, why, why did it take so long? Um, that's, that's for a few reasons. So first of all, the experiment ended at Brookhaven because it had kind of gotten to the point where, you know, we, we like to talk about the time it takes to double the statistics. That's the time it takes to get twice as much data and produce a result that is significantly smaller in its uncertainty. And the doubling, doubling time got to be rather large at Brookhaven. We would have had to run the experiment another three years or so to get another doubling. And there just wasn't time in their physics program. So the experiment had to shut off at that point. Um, also at that point, the experimental error was ahead of the theoretical error. So we could make our experimental error better and better and better. But until there were improvements in the theory, um, it, you wouldn't get as much gain from a comparison. And in the intervening 20 years, the theory has continued to improve. Uh, especially in this data-driven approach where many, many more data samples were taken from new accelerator complexes that have, that have been built and operated in the last 20 years. And the theory has grown uh, to become a much more robust cross-checked answer with an overall smaller uncertainty. And so all that needed to happen to really motivate the idea that you should do an experiment at much higher precision. Um, and so from there, you know, uh, it became, you know, it became obvious 10 years ago that this was a good idea to do. At that point, you start looking around and asking, where can you make a beam that's capable of putting together, you know, 20 times the muons into a device? Uh, and there's only a few places in the world that can do that. Um, and then it took a few years to get the thing approved to be done at Fermilab, to get it constructed, to analyze the data, uh, and to come out with the result. And so, so that's what drives the time scale for the 20 years. Um, how did I feel? How did I feel? Well, first of all, I can th I think I can speak on behalf of the collaboration and say how the collaboration felt as a whole. Uh, you know, 
for us, as I mentioned in the in the seminar, this was really the equivalent of a, a Mars rover landing moment for us because it really was an enormous effort. I told you hundreds of people contributed to it. Thousands of people years went into this effort to build and analyze the data. Um, and it all came down to this one unblinding moment where after all that effort, we were able to see what the final result was. Um, for me, it was a little different, I guess, because I was a graduate student on the first experiment. And you know, I worked with an extremely excellent set of physicists that I learned from on that experiment. And you know, I really fundamentally believed we had done an outstanding job in this experimental measurement that the world could stand behind and believe for the years to come. Um, so for me, it was just an overwhelming sense of, you know, some combination of relief and vindication to see that this new result when unblinded fell right on top of the Brookhaven result. Um, you know, it now basically anchors the new Fermi lab experiment in a way that we know we're going to have an experimentally consistent picture between Brookhaven and Fermi lab. And of course, that's very interesting. We, we, we like to, we like to make sure our experiments are robust. And so for me, it was a, a fantastic moment validating both experiments. Thanks, Chris. That, that, was, that was really helpful. Um, Aida, coming back to you. Um, and this is another follow-up from Seth Borenstein from AP, um, because yes wasn't, yes wasn't enough on the question earlier about kind of how does this fit in, uh, in the context of 50 years of the standard model. Um, would you say that, for example, um, you know, is this, is this a, a, one of the bigger things over the last decade or two decades or three decades? And, and in fact, I, I'm just going to add a little bit on my own here. I'm thinking back, you know, we're, we're a little more than 20 years um, from dark energy, from really the expand, you know, the accelerating universe discovery, which was really, really a huge deal. And uh, we're, we're almost 10 years away from the Higgs discovery. So um, where would you put this in kind of that kind of context? Uh, so I, I think um, ten years is a good is a good answer for that. The last major discovery was, as you said, Kevin, the discovery of the Higgs boson, and uh, people often uh, think of it as the last missing piece of the standard model. I think of it as the doorway into what lays beyond this model, and uh, so that is a really important marker, I think. Uh, and so in some sense, the G minus two experimental discovery, fingers crossed, thumbs pressed that it will happen, will be another marker, another doorway into the landscape that lies beyond the standard model. So 10 years is my answer. Great, thank you. And you know, it, it really, it really, uh... It does seem like when we start thinking about these things, that something exciting seems to happen about once a decade. So actually, hopefully the next exciting thing is even sooner, that's for sure. Um, let's see, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, let me direct this one um, to, uh, to Graziano. Um, this is from uh, Michael Greshko from National Geographic. Um, Graziano, if this discrepancy holds up, what would be on your wish list for future experiments? For instance, there's been some preliminary buzz for muon colliders, for, exa for example, at some point in the future. Um, what, what, what's on your priority list for kind of follow-up experiments that can help us further understand what's going on here? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And uh, well, uh, let's say, I think that uh, there is a basic question that we have to understand. Why, why the standard model has this family structure? So essentially our experiment, if, if let's say we will be confirmed, for example, but by the new, uh, the new results that we are going to, to, to also to, to give in uh, some years from now. So if we try, we, for example, we pass the Phi Sigma threshold. So this is a really claim, claim and discovery. Will tell us that there is a reason for that. So it means that the muons is not really elementary particle as we think. So I think that in this, this means that everything which has to do with the muons is something very exciting. So for example, a muon collider will be really a, a great opportunity for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the future. But not only that, I would say each experiment was, uh, will measure something which concerns the flavor characteristic of the standard model. So the flavor structure of the standard model. 
So I think that it's difficult to say, it's difficult to answer now, but I will say that it, for sure, the experiment which has to deal with the, with the muons, I mean, this, uh, in my opinion, will be very important. And if one has to think a little bit far away, one can think, for example, to the muon collider, but not only, there are very interesting experiments with the muons that are now in different laboratories. And uh, we mentioned, for example, not only GMOS2, but uh, Mu2E, but we can mention, for example, Mu A gamma, for example, at uh, PSI. And there are also uh, experiments at CERN on the mu with muons. Uh, so I think that all this kind of, of the experiment will be very, very interesting. But the more general, I will say the, the experiment, the research, we have to deal with the uh, flavor uh, characteristic of the standard model. So this, I think, so for example, the B, the, the, the B physics, but not all in summer, all these kind of experiments. Thank you, Graziano, and, and thank you to all our panelists. Uh, it, it, it's, it's time for us to wrap up. I want to thank uh, members of the media for some excellent questions. Um, all, the, all of the uh, participants in this press conference uh, will be available for any follow-up questions or conversations that you'd like to have. If you need any additional information or would like to schedule an interview, please send an email to media at fnal.gov. FNAL is Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, media at fnal.gov. I again wanna thank our governments and funding agencies from around the world that help provide the resources to make all of this work happen. On behalf of Fermi Lab, thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>